this meeting and discussion were very much the idea of the Honorable Joseph Giaguardi, a former member of the U.S. Congress, uh, the president of the Albanian American Civic League, an individual who has been interested in and concerned about human rights in the world and about the rights of all the peoples, the civil and human rights of all the peoples of the Balkan region, and has had a special interest in helping to further understanding of the role of the Albanian people, uh, both in Albania and in other states of the region. I'm going to call first on Congressman Diabardi, uh, and then next on Ms. Shirley Cloys, who is publisher of Lawrence Hill Books, uh, a, and has recently published an important and interesting book on the Balkan conflict. And last, I will call on Ilyas Halami, a member of the Macedonian parliament and president of the PDP party in Macedonia. Uh, he will speak with the help of interpretation. And at the conclusion of the program, and I will ask everyone to keep to the time, we'll then have an opportunity for questions and discussion. Uh, we must, however, leave the room by about five minutes after seven. This university with 20,000 students in the heart of Washington, D.C., is a very uh, exciting and interesting place to teach and to learn. And it's uh, a hallmark of our university that all of our meeting rooms are used almost all the time. And so there's another group coming in at 710. So that will prevent us really from extending the time, though I know many of us would like to. But let me begin. Uh, and introduce uh, the Honorable Joseph Diabardi. Thank you, Dr. Menges. I uh, remember well when I returned from Albania, the call I received from you when you were doing a uh, paper at that time from the, uh, the program here, and um, it was obvious to me that you not only had a real interest, you had a lot of knowledge in these very difficult places like Albania and the places that exist in the Balkans. I'm delighted to be here. There are other members of the Macedonian parliament here. We just returned, uh, we just came from the Congress where we had a uh, hearing and uh, literally it ended on the bell where they had a run uh, to cast a vote. So uh, that literally happened just before we got here. Now. The whole issue of the Balkans is a, and you'll meet, by the way, those members at the reception. The, the whole issue of the Balkans is, is a very confused thing for the United States of America, certainly from an American public opinion point of view. It's not easy for most Americans to relate to the geography of the Balkans, to the history of the Balkans. And further, when you get to the Albanian nation, of seven million people divided, but yet contiguous. Three and a half million in the state of Albania, now democratic, thank God, since 1990-91, the two elections. But the other three and a half million in what was Yugoslavia, now a renegade state called Serbia. Um, you've got Kosovo, uh, that's part of that, and you've got, it's not recognized by the United Nations, and it's not uh, recognized by the United States of America. And you've got uh, many Albanians that are in a system where they cannot express their rights, their, their national rights, in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, that is Kosovo, uh, which is a self-declared but non-recognized republic. It uh, does have a government in exile in Stuttgart, Germany. And you've got uh, Albanians, and you'll meet representatives from southern Serbia proper, which used to be part of Kosovo and Albania, when Albania emerged from the Ottoman Empire in 1912. That's the issue here, because what happened is these 7 million Albanians in 1912 were part of a state called Albania. But when they created the now defunct state of Yugoslavia, they literally put half the Albanian nation, gerrymandered them, into that state, but Albanians are not Slavs. So you had uh, Croats, Slovenes, Bosnians, um, Montenegrins, all Slavic people, Croatians, but yet they artificially put these Albanians into that state, and as you can see, there hasn't been peace ever since. I think the bottom line is that until the Albanian issue is addressed, this large, divided nation of contiguous people living side by side, even though they're in different jurisdictions, until that's addressed, 
there will never be long-term peace in the Balkans. And that's why these individuals came to Congress today uh, and yesterday to the Holocaust Museum representing this seven million people to make their case for basic human rights. And, and you might say, well, what is the American interest? And I, I, I said former Yugoslavia, but now we have a republic called Macedonia, which we recognize, but we haven't given an ambassador to, uh, and not every state has recognized it yet. Very fragile, but yet without it, Greece and Serbia would share a common border, and there might be more problems in the Balkans, but yet you've got a very large population of ethnic Albanians in that state without their rights. As a matter of fact, you've got the president from the University of Totova, an Albanian university which was just mowed down, literally with bulldozers, and that's an issue right now because Albanians are not able to educate themselves in that Slavic state, yet they are the second largest group in that now, in that now recognized state. So basically, and just the bottom line, why should we be interested in this? Well, if you think about what we did last night in recognizing for the first time that we had 30 Albanians that saved Jews in World War II, and for the first time now, Albania, because this information was buried in a communist regime for 50 years that did not want to promote its nationality but its, its communist government, you look at the human rights side of it, and you understand that what we stand for as a democracy, what that Statue of Liberty stands for, uh, is uh, basically the hope that people have to fulfill themselves as human beings. And yes, there is a moral imperative, I believe, for the United States when it comes to oppression on people that is state-imposed. And that's what you have today in the Balkans, in the former Yugoslavia, and in Macedonia. You have state-imposed oppression on a people, and I think as we know from the Holocaust experience, we should be saying never again, never again, because we see the beginnings of the conditions that existed in World War II. There is emerging a Warsaw Ghetto in Kosovo today because 90% of the population have no rights. They are completely controlled by less than 10% of the population, and this is a problem. The other issue is, why should we be interested? The geopolitics. Now, Bosnia is bad enough. And look at the lack of response that we've had in Bosnia today when we saw the concentration camps on our TV that the State Department said didn't exist, and yet four members resigned from the State Department because they knew it, and they knew that we were following a failed policy. Now, Bosnia cannot put Europe and the world in a war, but Kosovo and Macedonia can, because Albania, which is now its own state, has signed defense pacts with Italy, with the United States, and with Turkey. If something happens that affects the large Albanian population in Kosovo on the border of Albania, or in Macedonia on the border of Albania, the president of Albania has said, as weak as we are, as small as we are, we will not stand by while our brothers and sisters are slaughtered on the other side. We will have to get in there. Turkey says, if Albania is involved, we're involved. Do you think Greece is going to stay out of that one? So there is an interest that's even stronger than with the Bosnian situation. It shouldn't be that way, but it is because there could be, there is the potential for a European war if this tragedy spreads from Bosnia into Kosovo or Macedonia, and I think we want to prevent that. The best way to prevent it is to promote democracy. That's what we're trying to do by bringing these members of the Macedonian parliament, Montenegrin parliament, from Kosovo, here to Washington, so that they can express themselves, and perhaps we can stand for them, because they can't stand for themselves. They're not allowed any dialogue with the government, only police action, so that we can reduce the pressure bring democracy there to some degree, and hopefully stop the Balkans from escalating, or the Balkan crisis from escalating any further. That's about the best I can put it, Dr. Mengis, in a short period of time, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a succinct and um, most important presentation. May I ca call now on uh, Ms. Shirley Floyds? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, Dr. Mengus asked me to mention something about the uh, book on the Balkan conflict that I'm actually publishing. It's not out yet. It'll be out in two weeks. And it's called Yugoslavia's Ethnic Nightmare, the Inside Story of Europe's Unfolding Ordeal. It's edited by a journalist in the United States named Jim Ridgway, you may know him, The Village Voice, and a Yugoslav sociologist in Boston named um, <coughs> Jasminka Yudoviki. But most important, this is the first book in English that's written by people who are actually living inside the former Yugoslavia. It's written by an anti-war team of Muslim, Croatian, and Serbian journalists. And to my knowledge, it's also the first book in English to give us the voices of the opposition. We haven't heard those voices before. And it's the voices of resistance that are going to enable us to understand, I think, the most um, catastrophic event in Europe since the Holocaust. Now, for me as a publisher, um, this book actually is the result of a journey um, that began four years ago when I, and as I'm sure you did as well, um, sat with millions of Americans and watched images of atrocity from Bosnia and Herzegovina flash across our television sets. And I watched in horror, but then day after day, week after week, month after month, as the images mounted on the screen, so too did the rationalizations from our government for its inaction. And I realized that <laughs> suddenly nothing was going to be done or nothing was being done to stop the carnage inside the former Yugoslavia. And we, in effect, were being forced, all of us, to become complicit with it. We were witnessing unspeakable acts of violence and then being told that this was not our war, that there was nothing we could do about it, that it was a potential quagmire into which we would only venture at our peril, and that, of course, we couldn't possibly understand it. It was the result of all these ancient hatreds. Now, four years later, we have to ask ourselves, I think, where has this pernicious po you know, perspective crafted mostly by Western analysts, not people who are living and dying in the region. What has this brought us to? And in my opinion, it's brought us to the brink. We have 200,000 people dead. We have 2.2 million people homeless. All of us are standing by, basically, watching as the nation of Bosnia is gradually murdered. And most of all, this perspective has allowed the brutal Serbian occupation of the 90% Albanian majority in Kosovo to continue almost uncontested in the international arena and ignored in the press. And it has enabled Milosevic to act with impunity to the point that whether or we are not were able to avert the wider war that um, former Congressman Diabardi mentioned is a great possibility, whether or not we avert it, Neither the West nor the East can escape, in my opinion, responsibility for the rise of what is now a terrible new order of so-called ethnically cleansed mini-states in Europe. And by the way, um, notice the language of the final solution, which is what I call it. I, I, I believe that we must refuse to accept this reality and the language that represents it. What is happening in Bosnia under a clearly stated policy is mass murder, and we need, we need to name it as such. What is happening in Kosovo is apartheid, and we must not be intimidated by those who want us to minimize the suffering there. If we are to avert a wider war in the Balkans, then I believe that we have to become serious about seeking a diplomatic solution in the West. We have to look at the political causes of the conflict and then solve them. Now, in the United States, I think we have to begin by admitting that we have done very little more than to pretend to stop this conflict. Um, I don't know whether everyone in this panel will, will agree with me with this uh, uh, about this, but I think that um, our so-called diplomatic efforts to keep Bosnia together is nonsense. The U.S. hasn't been keeping it together. It's been presiding over its carving up. And I think if we're also serious about a diplomatic solution, then we're going to finally have to recognize that the Albanian 
uh, perspective and situation are key to that solution. And by the way, it would not surprise me if most of the people in the room don't even know that, because this conflict has not been adequately represented to us. It's one of the reasons why I'm publishing the book that I'm publishing. Um, one of the principal reasons why this conflict wasn't stopped in its early stages was that the United States and Western European countries completely failed to react when Milosevic invaded and occupied Kosovo in 1989. I think it's time that we re reject the notion that, I, I, I regret to report, we just heard on the floor of Congress today, that the U.S. has drawn a line in the sand and, you know, if Milosevic invades Kosovo, um, you know, we're not going to allow it to happen. I think it's time to say instead that the international community must insist on the reestablishment of Kosovo's autonomy and dem democratically elected government. It's time to stop the occupation. It's, 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 it's seven years, a whole generation is dying. Um, I think it's also time that the West um, get rid of this notion of ancient irresolvable hatreds going back thousands of years in the Balkans. We have to debunk this. Um, if we're going to invoke history, um, if we're going to point to some historical source, then we have to go back to 1912 and 1913 when the Ottoman Empire fell and the so-called great powers um, redrew the map of Europe. And it was at this time that the Albanian nation, as um, Congressman Diabardi mentioned, um, was divided and half of it was placed outside Albania uh, in the Balkans. And, until, and, and in this current period, we have 3.5 million Balkans, uh, Albanians, excuse me, living under occupation or severe repression in Europe. Until this is dealt with, the Balkan crisis simply will not be resolved. I think it's also time to stop explaining the conflict as a descent into ethnic and religious hatreds, um, especially when there were 50 years of what we could pretty much call um, inter-ethnic peace and harmony. Um, I think we better call it for what it is. It's a land grab. Um, Milosevic's territorial conquest is a quest for the resource-rich areas of Bosnia and ultimately Kosovo and Macedonia. That's why the war, if it spills over, will go into those two areas. It's not an accident. It's also time to, uh, and this is something that most commentators don't want to discuss. Um, they're afraid of being criticized. I think we have to end the fear. It's time to admit the degree to which Western anti-Muslim bias has, present, have, has prevented the emergence of any kind of coherent and lasting resolution. Um, the Muslims of Europe are isolated, they're under attack, and we can't allow the exaggerated fears of our government about the rise of a fundamentalist Muslim conspiracy. I don't know if you've heard this, that, that uh, you know, it extends pot potentially from Bosnia to Kosovo through the Sanjak into Iraq, Iran. Um, we can't let this govern um, our foreign policy. Albania, uh, I don't know whether you know, is, is basically uh, multi-religious. Um, it's Muslim. Uh, Eastern and Orthodox, and, and Catholic. Um, and Kosovo is 90% Muslim. In both cases, we are talking about secular, moderate um, Islamic regions. And one of the ways in which we can create a new and salutary bridge, between, salutary bridge between the East and West is to make sure that it's those groups that direct us on the issue of the future of Islam um, and, and, and not the specter that, that seems to be um, making us all too willing to sacrifice um, thousands of lives. And lastly, I think it's time to, to recognize that it is our war. Um, for any of us who have a stake in a multicultural, multi-ethic, multi-religious future, then we all have to work to stop the spread of, of ultranationalist politics and genocide um, wherever it exists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Flores. Now, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Ilyas Halimi, who is president of the People's Democratic Party and a member of the Parliament of Macedonia. First of all, I'd like to apologize for not being able to express myself in uh, the English language. This is an honor for me to be able to speak in front of the students and the professors of this university. Otherwise, as a Professor Omengis stated, we come from Macedonia, from one of the six republics of the former Yugoslavia.
the problems of the Balkans uh, as well as those of the world are uh, multi uh, uh, many, and it is very difficult to be solved uh, globally. I, would, I cannot speak for the problems of all the Balkans, but for those uh, that are uh, related to Albanians in Macedonia. Macedonia is one of the republics. Uh, began to be created as a newly independent country. But the problems that existed, international inter, uh, problems in, within Yugoslavia that existed before still exist today. Macedonia is a small country of around 2.1 million people with the two uh, majorities of Macedonians and Albanians mm -hmm. and a few other minorities. With the build-up of Macedonia as an independent country, as far as the, its uh, inner uh, build-up, Albanians are not uh, asked at all. Mm -hmm. Thus, it still continues to be built-up as a, a multi, as a single Macedonian state, without okay. thus uh, the discrimination against uh, Albanians and other minorities is still still continues today. Although we passed a multi-party system, the party that was in uh, uh, the Communist Party of the former Macedonia, uh, what happened to it? It uh, split into many parties, and it still rules the country. That's thus, the same uh, discriminating policies of the. The same for that party continue today. Thus, as a political party, we have raised our voice for the Albanian position in, within Macedonia. The through Bushman. contacts that we've had with the other governments of, of, the, of the world. But unfortunately, we did not have uh, the backup, the backing of uh, international uh, organizations mm -hmm. as, it, we, as we wanted. Okay. Thus, the internalization uh, of uh, uh, Albanian cause uh, ought to be uh, more uh, taken team. place. Thus, in this, in this direction, we, we ask for your uh, support and the support of the United States of America. I would just like to mention one example what kind of discrimination exists, exists in Macedonia. Even though one, over one, point, one third of the population is Albanian, Albanians are not allowed to, to really study in the, at the third level, which is a college level. Until Yugoslavia existed, Albanians could uh, go to universities of uh, other republics, as especially in the University of, of uh, Pristina, understandably in Albanian language, that is in Kosovo. The creation of the independent country of Macedonia, with the enforcement of the boundaries, the political ones, and while acknowledging the, the miserable situation in Kosovo, Albanians of Macedonia cannot go to colleges, the college of Pristina. Thus, it is paramount that uh, Albanians learn in their own language in the universities which uh, ought to be created in Macedonia. Thus, the intellectuals of university level created the uh, university in Albanian language, but the police forces of Macedonia did not allow it to live, the university. Thus, until now, they have not taken many uh, ways by bulldozing uh, the object, the university objects, by taking the professors, uh, as I say, downtown, <coughs> also by breaking in uh, in the uh, at the university, with a pretext that uh, this is a political uh, movement and not uh, a, a educational. Also, they undertake other measures against uh, leaders of the political parties, uh, with a pretext that uh, before the elections the Albanian flag was raised. That's the procedures procedure have have happened. Uh, judicial against myself, who is present over here. On the 25th of, uh, of the last month, I was supposed to go to uh, court, but I, as well as others, uh, have, uh, have uh, taken a lawyer who is representing us there. But this is only one example, and I cannot continue more. Uh, to show you, to tell you how much, uh, human, how much the Albanians are oppressed by the Macedonian authorities. I hope, uh, I am sure that you'll have any questions, questions in this regard, and I can uh, answer them as well as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Halimi, for that eloquent statement, and of course, here at a university, we can all the more understand the importance of the freedom to learn as well as uh, freedom of speech and assembly and organization that was described as being uh, violated. We've had three uh, important statements about the events in the Balkan region, and I would now open the floor to questions and comments. You might ask any one of the individual panel members. Um, and I'll recognize you, and I just would ask each person to keep their question or comment somewhat brief. So.
You're right. Do you know what the country of Albania has done to save the state of Macedonia because of the Greek blockade? It's allowed the flow of commerce through Albania. Now, can you imagine the pressure on this new president of Albania by this large group? Why are you doing that until they do something? But the state of Albania knows that without an existing state of Macedonia, Greece and Serbia would have a common border. They will be held to pay in that area with the Albanians. And, and that could happen. It theoretically could happen that this very fragile state could go down. So here you have Albania, in spite of the oppression, trying to help the state of Macedonia. And they say, why does it happen? It happens because Gligorov is a well-trained communist. He wasn't a former communist. He's a communist. He was Tito's best friend. And he may be Milosevic's best friend right now. He wants total centralized power just the way Mr. Milosevic wants total centralized power. They are going against the grain of democracy. Democracy requires pluralism, many voices, open elections, freedom of the press. They don't want that. The press is controlled in Belgrade with a very tight hand. Tanyug is not a free press. It's controlled by the party, the Milosevic party. And the same thing goes in Macedonia. They can't help themselves. And that's the problem the Albanians have. They're not trained in democracy. They don't know how to handle allowing the Albanians to have a voice. And it's incredible at a time when the state of Albania is practically saving the state of Macedonia. These almost one million Albanians in Macedonia have to put up with this because Mr. Gligorov is a well-trained communist who doesn't know any better. That's the only answer I can give you. I wish we could continue, but um, unfortunately our time with having this room is up. Uh, I thank all of you for coming. And then the man I just met from Adani, then a councilman from the Albanian uh, majority of the coast of our Shea Shea. So these are uh, individuals who participate in the government of Macedonia uh, and in the election process, but the election process is kind of rigged against them so that they can never be in a position to have the kind of uh, assertion of their national rights. So here we're trying to be a part of the government, as is Mr. Halimi from Prochefa, where they do vote in the certain elections there and the Macedonian elections there, unlike the Soma, where they don't want to legitimize what, they, what is an occupation. They, no matter whether they vote or they don't vote, the system is rigged against Albanians everywhere in the Balkans. And I think that's the bottom line of this, would you say? And, and that's why we wanted you to hear the various aspects of this divided nation of 7 million people in the Balkans with absolutely no rights at all and tremendous oppression. So with that, uh, uh, Paul Vintarian, Deputy Jeffery, would you give us your, in Albanian language? Yes, in Albanian. In Albanian, and we'll have to be more interesting. So we create a lot congressmen and everyone. Să ne putem destabiliza în America, nu-ți place.